Okay, so I can start. Okay. It's a great honor to be here today and to uh, learn who's working on conversion and invert reversion. <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole new world to me. The only thing I know about it is from a Frimes book. <laughs> Can you present yourself, please? Or if I uh, my name is Yehuda Kalinsky. I teach uh, medieval rabbinic literature and other things at Barilan. Okay. Uh, I want to introduce um, Ephraim Catafogel is uh, the Billy, am I pronouncing it right? Billy? Yes, Billy yes. Ivry, uh, University Professor of Jewish History, Literature and Law at U University Bernard Rebel Graduate School. A specialist in the field of medieval intellectual history, rabbinic literature, and he's the author of many books and even more articles. <laughs> now, I, I decided instead of reading the rest of that I prepared, I'll just just, just mention the, the books, the major books, major works. His first book was uh, Jewish Education and Society in the High Middle Ages. This has been translated to Hebrew for all people who have to teach Hebrew classes. Um, and also peering through the lattices, mystical, magical, and pietistic dimensions in Tosafot period. Hebrew translation as well. Um, the third book, which is not yet translated, but we want to know is it, it's, it's Intellectual History and Rabbinic Culture of Medieval Ashkenaz. This is a heavy book, uh, but people haven't seen it. And finally, we reached the topic of um, the conference, Brothers from Afar, Rabbinic Approaches to Apostasy and Reversion in Medieval Europe. He's going to speak to us today about that topic, returning apostates as converts in the writings of the Tosafists in northern France and Germany. Rep. Frame. Okay. The new book is we're in negotiation to translate now, but anyway, because we oh, want to have the Korea uh, read the O3. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Very nice to be here. Very interesting. Uh, I've learned quite a bit, and I'm very pleased that our new friends, the returning apostates, will once again be uh, <laughs> featured here, as I mentioned. Uh, this talk basically comes out of footnotes in the book that I didn't realize going this way, but uh, for this conference and for one other, I had to rethink it, and I hope that you uh, will help me to uh, perfect it, so then I won't make a book out of it, but at least there'll be another article if you got the totals going. <laughs> According to Rashi's interpretation of the Talmudic dictum, Afalpi Yisrael, Afalpi Shechata Yisrael, who a Jew, even if he has sinned grievously, remains a Jew, along with the practical halachic guidance that Rashi, who died in 1105, offered in several responsa, a Jew who had converted to Christianity under duress or even willingly was still considered to be fully Jewish. As such, according to Rashi at least, such apostates who wish to return to the Jewish community were not required to undergo formal rites to mark their reversion or to otherwise demonstrate, demonstrate their contrition, but only to rejoin the community in its religious life and practice. Beginning in the late 12th century, however, several leading communists and halachists in northern France and Germany, known, known as the Tosafists, put forward a series of more demanding requirements for those who sought to return following their conversion to Christianity. The centerpiece of this effort was ritual immersion, although specific reasons given or implied for this requirement vary as a means of purification or to achieve expiation, as an indication to the Jewish community of the sincerity and commitment of returning apostate, or even as a kind of unbaptism. Several German Tosafists ruled that reverting apostates should be treated largely as converts to Judaism, especially with regard to establishing the sincerity of the new intent. And that's what we're gonna talk about today, how these returning apostates were considered. So in Germany, there is a very clear attempt to link them to converts. While their northern French counterparts, the Balayatos of northern France, tended to maintain a very clear distinction between these two categories. That's what I want to develop with you. According to the German perspective, Eliezer Ben Joel Halevi, Rabbi Av Kelm, who died around 1225, here's a quote An apostate who wishes to return must shave his head, the Havir Alo Shaltar, and immerse himself just as a convert to Judaism must, Kagir. Kagir, but nonetheless. Raviyad does allow that the former apostate's immersion need not take place during the daytime, as was required for the immersion of Aguirre, since conversion to Judaism must be formally supervised by a duly constituted rabbinic court that can meet only by day. Uh, so that there was easement. But like the convert, rest uh, restoring up, returning apostates, I'm sorry, had to nonetheless formally assert their reacceptance of Judaism. They had to make a Kabbalah uh, in, the pro in the presence of a tribunal of three. So the only real difference in the halachic process to be followed by a reverting apostate as compared to that of a convert, according to Ravia, is that the reverting apostate's immersion may take place at night, 
although circumcision is also obviously not required for the turning apostate, not even the more symbolic drawing of blood known as hatafat damrit. This set of requirements for averting apostate is rather striking. Ravia clearly sought to formalize and verify the return of an apostate in a Beit Din-like setting, akin to the process of conversion to Judaism. A passage in the Sifra commentary that was initially attributed to the French Tosafist Samson of Sans, Shim Shon Mishans, an older, older contemporary Ravia, also maintains that the accepted procedure for a penitent apostate is to shave his head and pare his nails prior to immersion. And this passage refers openly to the returning apostate as a gear, as a convert. It has been shown conclusively, however, in light of other medieval rabbinic figures cited within the Sifra commentary, that this commentary was not the work of the French Samson of Sons, but rather that of a German contemporary of Ravia, whose teacher was, teacher was David of Munzburg. So these sound like boring details, but clearly uh, my Dr. Rand didn't say they love them. But uh, these are boring <laughs> details, but they clearly have a very important role here because you start to get a German position developing. Let me add on. Avigdor, son of Elijah HaKohen, Kohen Zedek, Katz of Vienna, a student of Rabbi Azrael and contemporary Simch of Spire, assumes without question, very interesting case, that a married couple who were both returning apostates must be immersed prior to the reacceptance into the Jewish community, and that they must shave their hair prior to the immersion as a symbolic removal of all of the impurities of idolatry. An issue for Avigdor Katz was only whether the couple also had to be separated for a period of three months known in halachic terminology and thinking as hatchana, as required of a, fem a female, maybe this or not, a female convert to Judaism. Avigdor's response that while a returning female apostate would typically be required, like a convert, to separate in order to ascertain whether she was pregnant with the child of a non-Jewish father, a period of separation is not needed in this particular instance because it can be assumed that this married couple continued to live only with each other during their period of apostasy. So for technical reasons, very interesting technical reasons, that uh, Havchana is not required, but a female returning apostate would be required to be treated again very you know, stringently, it says very carefully, as a female convert to Judaism would be. Uh, interestingly, I can't talk about this now, but I think the Katz was not the only Tosafist to presume that a married couple did not stray sexually if they apostatized together, and there's Christian literature here too, but again, that's a completely separate uh, issue, subject. In any case, while not all the German Tosafist formulations just described refer to a formal reacceptance of Judaism and Kabbalah, as Ravia did, they all clearly consider reverting apostates to be akin to converts who were required to submit to a reentry process that mirrored the conversion process. I will point out that two of Ravia's contemporaries have a German contemporaries have a slightly different reason. Uh, it's not a matter of minority, they have a particular pietistic reason, I'll mention it just for now. When we get to the French side, we'll see that none of this uh, conversion uh, um, verbiage is applied, nor are any of the policies, right? There's need for immersion, but not conversion, none of, none of the accompanying issues. Let me give you the two little German sort of, uh, uh, not exceptions, but sort of specific cases. In discussing the, the case of a female apostate who wished to revert, revert Simcha ben Samuel of Spire, mentioned just before, the German Tosafist held that the immersion period uh, required, uh, the uh, immersion required was needed to purify the penitent from sin, what, which committed while living among the Christians, so that the apostate can now return to Judaism in a state of purity. Uh, Simcha cites a passage from the Jerusalem Talmud to this effect that immersion requ is required whenever one passes from a state of impurity to a state of holiness. The immersion required of a returning apostate then is a penitential act while the immersion that a convert must undergo is required by Jewish law unrelated to and beyond an act of penance. And Simcha of Spire accordingly makes no reference to converts in this ruling. For Elazar of Worms as well, and here Elazar is speaking, or I'm speaking about him as a leading Rhineland halachist, and not only as a pietist student of Judah Hasid, the immersion required of a returning apostate is linked to the other penitential acts, acts that he uh, or she had to undertake. In any case, we have this German position, which does make this linkage very clear. We have the pietistic position sort of on the side. Just to note where this moves forward before I come back to France, in any case, by the mid to late 13th century, what I'm calling the stringent approach, this demonstrative approach favored by Ravia and the other colleagues, Tosafist colleagues in Germany, makes its way into northern France as well. Abraham Ben Ephraim, in his abridgment of Moses of Kusi, say from its own Kabul, which has written quite a bit, known in this book as Kitsur Smad, composed around 1265, cites Ravia's approach essentially verbatim, albeit in the name of identified authorities, Omrim. However, this is one of nearly 10 instances in which this particular work, Kitsur Smad, 
whose major teacher was actually a French post of the studio of Vienne, includes passages from Ravia's work. So the influence here is clear, although in most, but not all these instances, Ravia's name is mentioned. Here's another example of this thing moving into Northern France, a little bit more involved in interpreting the rights that the Levites had to undergo as detailed in Numbers 8, when they were initiated into the service of the tabernacle in place of the firstborn, the Mishkan. They were immersed in holy water. Their clothing was washed. They were required to shave their entire bodies. In light of that, the Chizkuni commentary to the Torah compi compiled by Hezekiah ben Manoach in Northern France, it seems, around 1275, cites Rashi's commentary, which includes a passage from the 11th century Provençal exegete, Moshe HaDarshan of Narbonne. The appointment of the Levites was meant to atone for the firstborn sins of sons, sin of idolatry and worshiping the golden calf. It's a kind of a, a formula here. Idolatry is characterized by sacrificial offering to the gods at the hands of officiants who are considered to be spiritually dead offerings of Chaymetim. Now you got to go like this. Since a leper is likewise characterized as dead by the Talmud, the Darim 64b, Mitzvah Hashuk the Torah required the Levites to shave their entire bodies just as lepers do when they seek purification. Like the leper, the Levites here are also moving on some level forward from the state of spiritual death associated with idolatry, sin of the golden calf in particular, to renewed life in the service of, of the Almighty. And here's where Tizkuni makes the following note. The passage there reads, and I quote, and for that reason, penitents, and he means apostates, as he specifies, are also required to shave themselves. So it's uh, the same model. Textual variants of this commentary add that the returning apostates are required to shave themselves and to immerse, which was also the case for both the lepers and the Levites. That would seem to be a fair uh, addition. However, among the northern French Tosafist sources that required immersion for returning apostate, and there were quite a few. Rashi was less, quote unquote, modified in France, but he was modified nonetheless on this. But there were none before these two texts from the late, no French text from before the late 13th century, it seems that the German material has moved, which is typical at that, in that period. Um, and uh, uh, so there are no other, no other French texts that I'll now show you, which included any of the other stringencies that Rabia and the other German Tosafists of this period uh, had expressed. There was no need uh, in Northern France for a formal reacceptance of Judaism, a Kabbalah, before a rabbinic, rabbinic tribunal for the reverting apostate, no demonstrative shaving of the hair beyond, here we go with Chatzitza again, what might normally be required to ensure an effective ritual immersion. And indeed, there were no tight comparisons made between a reverting apostate new, and a new convert to Judaism, no gay root lingu linguistics or even uh, you know, uh, ceremonial parallels. Thus, for example, so let's now go back to Northern France and see what's not there that was there in Germany. And then I'll talk about obviously a key point why I think this happened. Thus, for example, Rashi's great grandson, the Tosef is Rio Dompierre, who died around 1190, was asked about a self proclaimed returning apostate who would touch Jewish wine. He had already joined the Jewish community, according to his report, and returned to Jewish practices as far as everyone could tell. And he, as anyone could tell, or everyone, and he asserted without any objective evidence, however, that he had also undergone immersion. We didn't have a petek from the mikvah, but the extent and sincerity of his repentance had been formally verified before a, uh, uh, before a body of three judges. In, per, in permitting the wine for Jewish consumption, which we did, uh, and obviously this presumed this person's status as a member in good standing of the Jewish community, Re notes that unlike the immersion required by law for a convert to Judaism, so it's dispositive, unlike the, the Gare, which he designated as a chova, an absolute halachic obligation, so we've got real halachic terminology here too, the ritual immersion for returning apostate is merely a mitzvah. This is the immersion itself, it's a mitzvah, a proper religious act, a good act. If in fact the returning apostate had not actually undergone this reversion as he had claimed, his present status as a member of the Jewish community is not thereby compromised according to the strict letter of the law, provided that the former apostate is now observing Jewish law and rituals he once did, something which according to Re is quote, easily verified, right? Kal, it's very easy to establish by the other members of the community, small communities, you know, they see are you in there or not, you know, six synagogues, one that you do go to, one that you don't go to, one that you send other people to. Basically, you're there. There are 18 butcher shops with different kashkachot. You've got, you know, that's the way it is. Um, and thus, more formal acceptance and verica verification, as in the case of a convert, is clearly not required. And again, re adds, this is all we talking, not me. This is so because a reverting apostate is not changing his religious status or level of required observance to one that is completely new or foreign to him. And so no formal act is required as it is for a convert to Judaism. 
Indeed, for the convert, his own statement of sincerity between individual Jews would be sufficient, absent the formal procedures that must be carried out under the formal direction of a rabbinic court, a Beit Din. So while we discuss his reverting apostates and converts in the same passage, the distinctions are clear and total. Uh, and the immersion, again, is for some other reason, and that depends on which version of the Rees uh, text you read. Again, might be penitence, might be uh, sort of deterrence, you know, might be a verification of sincerity, but it's not a matter of Geirut in that sense in any way, or even akin to Geirut. The reverting apostate, I'll, I'll just fill that in right now, the reverting apostate whose case was brought to Rees' attention had apparently also asked him on his own for a document that would verify his return. Re, however, refused precisely because he felt that this formal documentation was required only for a convert. There are to udot gerim or gerut, but not for reverting apostate for whom a return to the community and prior practice was sufficient. Re's student, Isaac Ben Abraham of Don Pierre, gets confusing, known by the act. I was going to give you a chart of, you know, scorecard, but I decided that would be more confusing. Uh, his student, uh, I just think France and Germany will be fine. Isaac Ben Abraham of Don Pierre, known by the acronym Ritzba, who died in 1209, and you can see the history progressing, wrote regarding a similar case that if the former apostate has returned to the community, um, in Ritzba's case, interestingly, the reverting apostate, this is a real case, had left his billfold with him over the Shabbat for safekeeping. You know, he pushed his money away on the Shabbat, you hold it, which was pointed to as a palpable sign of his return to Jewish observance. You know, put your mouth where your money is or something. Anyway, he is considered a Baal Shuvah in all respects. Additional formal verification beyond immersion in the mikvah, which we apparently take his word for, is not required. He's supposed to do it, is not required of the averting apostate because wow. now. He is only, according to Ritzba, only slightly comparable to a convert. The Dome Tzat Lager. So same sentence with this intervening Tzat. Again, keeping those two contenders in different sides of the uh, ring. That's a boxing which I don't know. Anyway, Ritzba's brother, Samson Ben Abraham Sanz, Rosh Vishan, who I mentioned earlier, earlier, was less sanguine than either Rui Ritzba about the absence of a more formal means of verification. In other words, Rosh Vishan was nervous about this. We need Need more teeth here. And he quotes a Gaonic responsum, and here the scholars of Gaonic can help, attributed to Rav Tzemach Gaon of the late ninth century. We know Rav Tzemach Gaon. Where is this response? How did this one get to Ashkenaz? Lo Yodim, but that's the whole story. I'll just say as an aside, in the light of the last lecture, the Gaonic and Ashkenazic positions don't meet until 13th century Spain which Paula has used very nicely. And again, I'm not selling the book, but you can read about that there. I'm not going to hear about this now. Which did not require immersion at all, since this is merely a private act. There's the Yaonim, who some of whom require public admission and all that. No, no, no mikveh in the Yaonic period. And Rashmi Shan said, right, because the mikveh is, I don't want to say useless, but it's not going to help, right? Unless it is witnessed, right? In other words, if it was witnessed, maybe that would help, but that's something else. But no Tosafists in northern France required any kind of witnessing for a returning apostate as they did for a convert. But Tzemach Gaon, however, did mandate that the former apostate must undergo lashes, stand before the congregation, and confess publicly what he had done and what sinful behaviors he was unable to resist. So it's a completely different approach. In Rosh Vishant's view, right, um, if the reverting apostate, in fact, is fully sincere, uh, how do we show that? He should at least be prepared to appear before rabbinic scholars, Chaveirim, he should make a voluntary appointment who would verify, who could verify his true intentions and commitments. Very sensitive stuff. But that's, you know, you gotta, you gotta talk to somebody about this issue. Although Rashmi Shan suggests that this aspect of the more stringent requirements, which was enunciated, that's how he began by Raviyah, a bit later, be adopted. He said, that's a good idea. It is nonetheless clear that he did not consider the turning of to be akin to a convert to Judaism for whom neither lashes nor public confessions were even a remote possibility. And Rosh does not refer anywhere in his formulations to Geirim or Geirut. So Rosh had a verification problem in Northern France, which he didn't seem to act on, but not because he thought there was a conversion issue. He just wants to make sure that this returning apostate is sincere. Rather, the apostate is a Jew who has indeed seen, sinned grievously, and he must now properly represent himself before both God and man in order to fully return to the Jewish community. So all these French sources, and these are the leading Tosafists in the period, Precious little about Gerim, no real comparisons, any comparison with diminutives, Kitsat, you know, a little bit don't mention it at all, and the Germans are lining up with these um, very clear connections. Let's move the ball a little bit forward. In the second quarter of the 13th century, and this will relate to something that was mentioned before as well, the Tosafist study hall in Evro put forward a Talmudic model for the immersion of reverting apostate. It's absolutely right. 
they're calling this as they, they're making this up as they go. So the trick is let's Talmudize it. So here's the model they chose, which is perfectly legit in post activity. That's, they knew the Talmud, so they could use the stuff to justify it. Many times it followed the Talmud, but sometimes they had to, you know, negotiate. The penitent apostate must undergo immersion, la sot hekera. That's the word that's used in order to signify a distinction or demarcation between this, his activities as an apostate and his newly renewed status as a full member of the Jewish community, which is also characterized in this passage as mishum ma'ala, which we might refer to in travel terms since I do a little bit of that as an upgrade. And he's going from being an apostate back to the community, reg, and therefore he's got to show, you know, uh, and they'll, they'll let him go on without waiting online. The model for this immersion and purpose, interestingly, here we go, is a Canaanite slave who is completely free, right? The Evet Kenani who gets freed completely, you know, the, it, it, not supposed to be, but he is, right? It happens, he's free. As a slave, this individual, of course, already obligated in a variety of commandments, which was treated as a kind of conversion to Judaism going in, right? The slave was initially circumcised and immersed in the mikvah. At the point that he is freed, however, no circumcision, even hatafat no, no redoing of that is required, although another immersion is required according to the Talmud and tractate Yivamot. And my mom always thinks this is a Torah law, it's got a whole interesting approach, but that's not what the Tosafists said. This immersion signifies it's a rabbinic immersion, it's not Torah required, because it signifies that the slave is transitioning from a, slave to this, from a state of slavery to one of complete freedom, similar in empirical terms, at least, to the return of a former apostate to a higher status as a fully recognized and religiously obligated member of the Jewish community. Here again, initial conversion to Judaism does not stand in any way at the root of this procedure for the returning apostate, right? Because the slave going out, that's not a gay root. That's not completing the gay root. That's now the move. He's already part of the community. He's now a bigger part, a fuller part. So again, might be some comparison, but it's really a very uh, slight one. So we have the German sources, which stress the comparison of the apostate to the gay. We have the French sources, which do quite a bit even if they refer to aspects of it, they keep it very, very separate. And so now the question is, how should this dichotomy, and almost not, with regard to conversion and reversion between the Tosifists of Northern France, who did not see, or at the very least, largely downplayed any connection between these two constructs, and those of Germany, who with minor exceptions, consistently pointed to an even heightened disassociation be understood. To do that, I'm going to suggest that there was point out another aspect related to conversion to Judaism, to conversion, about which rabbinic sources in northern France and Germany expressed by the different perspectives that I think can prove helpful. And here's what I'm going to look at: the extent to which they referred to Christian pressures, to which the rabbinic literature referred to Christian pressures being applied to thwart the conversion of Christians to Judaism. Again, we're going to see here a clear dichotomy between France and Germany. And I'm going to suggest that if we put these two things together, we might have the beginning of a solution to this issue that I've dealt with at this point. In Northern French sources, there is little mention of any such pressure, whether or not it actually existed. They didn't talk about it. In addition, there was evidence for a fully developed rabbinic policy. And so that's the you know, quiet argument. Here's the active argument. There was evidence for a fully developed rabbinic policy in Northern France to ease the conversion of Christians to Judaism, not a mission, but an easement. And not that there were so many actual cases, as far as we can tell, but nonetheless, uh, which began in the days of Rio Don Pierre, right? When we start to see this dichotomy that I'm pointing to today and ran through much of the 13th century. So exact same time time start. Within the literature of the German Tosifists, on the other hand, and I'll specify in a second, there are several strongly worded statements that express grave concerns about Christian reprisals when uh, Christians convert to Judaism, and they go further than that. Sefer Asufot, the halachic compendium from the second quarter of the 13th century, so a manuscript whose anonymous author is linked to both Ravi and Lazar of Orms, just to give you the context, writes, and I quote, at present, it is a life-threatening act, sakanat nefashot, to convert anyone to Judaism. Now, they could be just doing that for the cameras, but they then basically, you know, he mentions something about conversion, like, oh, yeah, there are some laws, but let's not do them now because it's a sakanat nefashot. Uh, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, not like here. While a passage in the slightly earlier Sefer Hasidim indicates, you know, again, an exemplum, which can be used in these contexts, that the circumcision of a, circumcision of a particular convert in waiting could not be performed because the Jews of his town feared that the Christians would become aware of it. In the second half of the 13th century, Mayor Rothenberg Maharam describes a situation in which four Jews were compelled by the ruling authorities to testify under oath 
and under the threat of confiscation of their property if they did not tell the truth about the identity of a fifth Jew who was in fact a Geir, a convert to Judaism. Although according to Jewish law, the four Jews would have been permitted to swear falsely to the effect that the fifth Jew was not a convert or to otherwise prevaricate, since the situation posed a real and present danger, they truthfully confirmed that this fellow was a convert. Maharam, in his response, exclaims that most, fortuitous, for, most fortuitously, the convert was not then burned at the stake, since, quote, when apostates, this is what he's calm response, when apostates from Judaism to Christianity testify about a convert to Judaism, he is burned. How much more so would Jews testify against him? Instead, the gear in this instance was let off with a rather stiff monetary penalty, which the other Jews who had testified to this effect were required by Rebbe Mayor Maharam to pay. Uh, but it's Maharam's expression of astonishment that the convert to Judaism accept death, ex, uh, sorry, escaped death in this case, which is clearly the most striking aspect of his response. Similarly, Chaim or Zarua, astute the Maharam mentions that a certain Rabbi Isaac, not his father, but a certain Rabbi Isaac, who circumcised converts uh, uh, in their conversion to Judaism, caused his community thereby to be threatened with bo bodily harm. So there were people who were trying to do conversion anyway, but the German sources are replete with potential harm, real harm, warnings, and so on and so forth. None of this in the French rabbinic source. All of these descriptions suggest that the pressure brought to bear by Christians in Germany when their co-religionists co sought to convert to Judaism involved much more than just sharp rhetoric. Now, it was during precisely the same period, as I said, from the late 12th century through the 13th, that we have the greater demands that were being made on reverting apostates by both French and German Tosafists as composed to the re relatively easy position of Rashi, who didn't seem to require any of this based on the principle of Avapi Shachata Yisrael, who, but we saw that there is a difference between France and Germany. And let me now bring these two uh, distinctions, these two different uh, sets of uh, positions together. There is little doubt that these changes were connected in some way you know, the fact that people went beyond Rashi, including his descendants to require something, and in Germany to require even more. So this is stuff in the book, but there is little doubt that these changes were connected in some way to a sustained renewal of violence against Jews in both areas, in Northern France and Germany, beginning in the late 12th century, as, as recorded in Ephraim of Bonn's Sefer Zechirah, for example, and as categorized, categorized and analyzed most fully by Robert Chazen in a number of studies. In addition, Newly articulated and especially pernicious accusations were being leveled by ch churchmen against the Jews at this time, led by Rupert of Deutz, who died in 1129, and presented in even more vituperative terms by Petrus Venerabilis, Peter the Venerable, Abbot of Cluny, who died in 1156, to the effect that the Jews had by now become the arch enemies of Christianity. It's a new level of enemy. Although the approaches of Rupert and Peter were not adopted uncritically by all subsequent thinkers in their writings, and there's evidence for this, there is no doubt that a new element of blatant animus had been introduced into the medieval Christian attack on Jews and Judaism. Indeed, Gavin Langmuir maintains that the hatred of Christians for Jews moved by the middle of the 13th century, exactly at this point, from a rational, in quotes, form of anti-Judaism to a, quote, visceral hatred. Within Northern European Jewish society, the apostate thus became by definition, more of a threat to the Jewish community as well. An apostate from Judaism was now seen as something of an ally of the increasingly hostile enemy of the Jews that Christianity had become. Right, a friend of my enemy is my enemy. German Tosafists took the lead in incorporating these views, not only with regard to the scope and severity of the rights that a returning apostate had to undergo, but also by limiting the doctrine of Alpha Pisha Chata Yisrael, who, as it related to an ongoing apostate in a range of Jewish uh, areas of Jewish law and life, as I've discussed in detail elsewhere. A partial is just to give you a sense of what we're talking about, includes both economic and marital issues, such as lending money and interest to an apostate, the status of sexual relations that a Jewish woman had with an apostate, and their effects on her Jewish marriage, and the, disqualifi the disqualification of an apostate from performing chalitza, if he's the only living brother available, since his status as a Jew was now in grave doubt. The formulations of rabbinic authorities in both France and Germany that have been noted above that we've talked about with regard to the path of apostate's return along the, with those that, are, those that are found in these other areas of Jewish law proceeded, of course, primarily along established halachic lines. I'm not saying that the rabbis just stuck their head out the window and said, oh boy, we got to see which way the, uh, you know, they're not politicians, which way the people are going. Nonetheless, changing societal factors also played a legitimate role in thinking of the Tosafists as we know, and the increasing stringencies overall in both Jewish geographic centers of Northern Europe surely reflect these changes we have described them. 
And now we get the, the specific difference that we talked about. At the same time, however, the specific differences and distinctions that have been noted between the views of the Tosafists in Northern France and those of Germany with regard to reverting apostates can also be related to the different rabbinic perceptions uh, and descriptions concerning conversion to Judaism in Germany and Northern France. And here's where it goes. Since conversion to Judaism seemed more possible, at least in theory, in Northern France during the Tosafist period, the halachic categories and status of converts to Judaism, to Judaism and of apostates from Judaism, including those who later sought to return, had to be maintained as fully distinct because both of these categories were needed. A convert was one category in Jewish law. The apostate, again, based on an understanding of Talmudic law, but largely being uh, not made up, but sort of developed for whatever reason, we can talk about that too. These two categories had to be maintained as fully distinct. A person born a Jew who apostatized and then sought to return to Judaism could not be assigned the same halachic regimens or status as a convert to Judaism. In Germany, however, where conversion to Judaism was considered, at least by some rabbinic authorities, perhaps most, to be nigh impossible during this period because of the dangers involved, the growing negative feelings toward apostasy and apostates, which existed in all places, this is not a German feeling, it's not that the Germans are tough guys and the French were, you know, nicer guys, that's not what it was about, <laughs> could be allowed to expand, that might be true, or the French, I guess maybe I'll get much nicer guys, but anyway, uh, just joking. Effectively rendering an apostate kager as one, as akin to one who was coming to Judaism for the first time. So the, the separation between those uh, concepts and constructs collapsed and you have almost an identity, right? Just about a convert to Judaism who did not, uh, a convert to Judaism who did not fulfill the uh, um, uh, requirements of the rabbinic court could not be accepted. These same requirements with minor exceptions were now placed on reverting apostates in Germany, reflecting in a more graphic way the spiritual distance they had to traverse in order to fully return to the Jewish community. Thank you. Okay, we have some time uh, for questions. I'm hoping we we'll have some questions. That, I'll have to ask them. <laughs> Going to reread line slowly, I can do that too. <laughs> okay, I'll start and then we'll go to. Um, I'm really sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. Now. The entire Republic. Please continue. Please continue. <laughs> <laughs> you just started the war with the Republic of France. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm not going to make it work. <laughs> okay. um, I was hoping you could. Uh, I, I, I followed the entire lecture, but at the end, I, miss, I must have my attention span must have gone off. I, I don't really get um, the connection, be the linkage between uh, accepting new converts as. Um, in, in like in places like Germany because they fear what it's going to do to the community and discouraging the return of um, Mumarim, of uh, people who, con who converted to Christianity. Are you trying to say that because of the same fear, in other words, because the canon law says that like a Jew converted Christianity, mm -hmm cannot come back to the community. Mm -hmm. So are you trying to say that or, or are you trying to say something else? I, I wasn't clear what you were. So, so that may be a factor, although I, I was shaking my head, I have a tele habit of telegraphing my response. <laughs> uh, that might be a possibility, but I, I think that it is simply um, uh, where I'm starting from is as follows. Both in Northern France and Germany, the you know that's that's what the book is about. The notion of Afapisha Chata Yisrael, who just come back, no requirements, you know, sort of no no probation, none of that, is quote unquote under attack, right? A um, little less in France, and by the way, there are Tosafists who follow Rashi's uh, uh, you know a very gentle position completely, but the difference is rather perceptible, and the question is, there are two issues. One is exactly the cause, but the other is simply how far do we, should we, can we push this new requirement, right? Again, the I purposely gave examples, and there are others. Uh, Rupert is making his uh, sentiments known in Germany, in the Rhineland. Deutz is, uh, um, um, uh, Peter is obviously in northern France. And so everybody, French and German Jews are under the same, you know, those are extreme examples, but they're under the same uh, um, pressure. Um, pressure. So the question is, what pushes the Germans further than the French? So one possibility may be that they are, you know, just worried, more worried, but that's the point. Because they're more worried and they're more worried about 
both ways. They're worried about conversion to Judaism. They're worried about everything. And therefore, they have the ability, though, in other words, then there's a the technique. So how do you deal with this? Again, as I say, this is all being not made up in a complete fabrication sense, but these are halacha categories being created, existing categories are being pushed. So the Germans are suggesting that we have room to push this pretty far, right? There's a, there's a halal sham, there's a, there's a space in the halachic system, because it's got to make sense halachically. I mean, there are takanot and fiats and all of that, but we'd like to think they make sense most of the time. And, you know, I make a living assuming they do, but you know, sometimes not, but usually they do. Um, they're a little smarter than we are usually. Um, and um, uh, so they've got the room to make that move. The French, in addition to whatever lesser pressures they felt, didn't have that much room to give because they, in theory, had both things happening. And, and by the way, it's not evident anywhere that rever reversion was discouraged, right? Mm -hmm. It just so happens, again, stuff in the book, uh, three German Tosafists decide an apostate who's not yet returning, no chalitza. Nobody in France dares make that move. So the Germans are definitely, let me say a you know, funny thing here, friskier in terms of pushing the apostates, keeping them where they are, but mm -hmm. I don't think they're not gonna take them back. Mm -hmm. Now, some of what Ravi Yah was doing with verification is because again, this is a severity question. I don't think it's, the Germans were inherently more superstitious, but I think the main point they're trying to make is there's more room in the system to expand right beyond. By the way, that's how I understand when the French do say, domek tzat, you know, that's Rosh Mishan to say, we well, have to push this further. We're being mm -hmm. too, not too lenient, we're being too rigid. Uh, rigid. Yeah, category. we've got to, right, we've got to, and, and we need, because we need more help to verify. Mm -hmm. So we've got to be able to push this. Nobody bought it there in France, that's the point. In Germany, they bought it very much. Uh, Adam, you had a question? I have four questions. Four questions. Yeah, really quick. Uh, uh, the we'll bring them up. The <laughs> <of five minutes. laughs> Four questions. I haven't heard you in a long time. It's just wonderful. So rich and <laughs> wild. Okay, here we go. One, um, could you give us some sense of what you think about how many um, regular con converts there were in, 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 in any of these periods in any of these countries? Um, I'll go through four of them. Okay. Quick. Two. Um, it's a it's a stringency in terms of uh, a personal status law. So is it possible that there is a pushback against Rashi causing more Agu notes to be uh, around? Um, okay, two, three. Um, uh, Germans and Magia. I mean, the way that you describe the whole ceremony that they came up with, it just sounds very a lot of uh, Magia type of things here. You know, there's a whole. So you wrote a book about the capitalistic elements of it. Did you did you address that? Or finally, in terms of of these um, um, uh, these mishumadim, getting back to a previous discussion a little bit, I just that just there's a real um, romanticization of mumarim in both uh, you know starting with all of that Yoshua through uh, uh, a lot of uh, academic literature lately because they're kind of these liminal, interesting sort of bridges between societies. So uh, I'm wondering if um, that element, you know, the question of what is there, I don't know, it's a very binary question, but do these people think they have a Jewish identity? Do they think they have a non-Jewish identity? Do they, what do they think of these people who are coming and saying, you know, I, I, I want to come back to, you know, those, those are four questions. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. One, in terms of stats, there are people who offer statistics. The best statistics we have were done by a, a buddy of mine who's a very distinguished rabbi in Brooklyn these days in a young Israel. So, you know, we're, he's a wonderful fellow. He wrote, <laughs> he wrote a master's degree, a master's thesis in 1977, which we have in the Shiro Library. And he did stats. Kenny uh, Allen, he did stats. Um, what he found, he's, it, the numbers that you can document are in the tens, they're not in the hundreds. Right? Powell may have better numbers, but you know, she's been doing a lot of work here. So the numbers are not big. What he did show is that there seem to be more actual numbers in France than in Germany. And part of what I'm assuming here is not to run afoul, you know, again, of the evidence, because he basically cites other people, um, and I'm sure it could be updated based on, uh, you have a sense of numbers, Powell, or are you? Tens. I mean, it's, well, okay. look, we only know of cases when they get into Right, right. so that's, that's, that's create, the problem, right? We, don't, we, we can't pull the phone logs, you know, we can't have the uh, electronic surveillance. So that's that's mm -hmm. number one. As far as Afi Shukhatai Israel, who Adam makes a very important point here, and that is the sainted Rashi, you know, who everybody's, everybody's favorite, you know, grandfather with a big white beard, right? Rashi's a bully, right? He says, let the apostates come back. There are some Humrot that 
invariably come from it. There are some stringencies, right? Therefore, Rashi says, against what later German coast of the Senate, against the Gelim, who split it into half, that a Jew is a Jew is a Jew, and therefore, if the only brother who's available to do Chalitza, Yibum Chalitza, you got to do one or the other, but we'll make him do Chalitza, you got to do something, is an apostate, Tufskis, he's got to do it. Not because I like... And if he doesn't, she can't get married. Right. But again, Rashi's very clear, not because I like Agunot less, but because I like the Jewish people more. In other words, but that's, but that's a Rashi problem. So the question like is... Like Jewish men more. Right. So the question is, you know, we, so the old problem, you know, 21st century questions imposing them on 12th and 13th century Tosafists are people doing that. Now, by the way, you do have this. You know where you have this? You have this uh, Ben Sia Netanyahu's book, uh, as just covers it. You have this in the post expulsion periods, right? Where, again, rabbis who 50 years before said, oh no, sorry, Chalitza, now say, ah, not Jewish, marry. Of course, there was no choice. So first of all, there's not as long a game here. So I'm not sure that that's a factor. I mean, you need to think about it, but I'm not sure. Um, I have a lot of fun with this. I always think to myself, do my books actually get along? And sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes I change my mind. And sometimes I think it's really hilarious. Um, Germans love ceremonies, but the problem here is that, you know, Ravia is a, a pious and pietistic a little. He's not the world's biggest magician, for example. A, a big de Katz is more into that. I don't see such a good correlation. By the way, so is Rhea Dompierre against his students and against Rabbi Tom. So I don't see, you know, again, I feel being here because I'm the I'm the Mechaber of both the Shmatot here. So I'm, I'm calling both signals and maybe somebody else will reason it differently. But I, I don't see it, but I have to think about it. And finally, just the perception. So I have in the book this great category, which the um, person who did the index was smart enough, a very excellent person, to, to actually make an entry. Flip-flop. There were Jews who went one week, they went to, and we have to collect, uh, uh, you know this, Moshe, uh, you have it too, uh, to collect staka amongst the Jews. You know, they turned the thing inside out. The next week they went to co collect among the Christians. Marami Rutenberg talks about a returning apostate, uh, sorry, a Jew who he wants to use as a, a witness in a, in a case of a husband who died, they found. And he ends up trusting non-Jewish highwaymen over this guy, this, because he says, Tovel Vesheretz Biadal. You get whiplash from this guy. So one of the key, I'll, I'll, I'll answer your question by saying this. The borders here are so porous, despite the pressure of the church and whatever other person, the borders are so porous. You know, you can be here today. I, it's, it's not as easy as I make it. And Sefer Hasidim, by the way, is nervous about that. But the borders are very porous. So I don't think they're doing theological hand-wringing as much as they're doing practical procedures. That's four. Okay. 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 Already, I'll stop my uh, essay. <laughs> Hey, it's a great treat to have Paula here. I haven't seen her since Corona, which is uh, at least uh, two and a half years, maybe more. <laughs> uh, Ephraim managed to come in despite Corona. <laughs> okay. Uh, Paula is professor of history and Jewish studies and chair of the Department of Jewish Studies at Rutgers. She's author of two books. And what I like about the, her two books is that they're in different areas. Usually people who work on Spain just stick to Spain. People work on Ashkenaz, stick to Ashkenaz. But Paula <laughs> did her first book on Aragon, between Christian and Jew conversion and, and inquisition in the medieval crown of Aragon. And her second book is in England, uh, Conversion, Circumcision, Ritual Murder in Medieval Europe, um, which deals with the Norwich circumcision case. She has received fellowships from National Endowment of Humanities, Fulbright, European Institute of Advanced Studies, Israel Institute of Advanced Studies, CAT Center, et cetera, et cetera. But most important, she's the recipient of a Rutgers Presidential Fellowship for Teaching Excellence. And that is something I admire. Okay. So I'll be speaking to us about churchmen con converts to Judaism in 12th to 14th century Europe. 
Thank you so much, Judah. Thank you to everybody for being here. I know it's been a long day, so I'm going to try to be animated and speak quickly so we stick to our time when I have time for some conversation and then a much needed break. So it's such a pleasure. Uh, I'm sorry. He has a competition. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Take your time. Take your time. We have time. We have plenty of time. No you rush. Can tell. Okay, so um, it's really moving for me to be here today in person with old friends and new friends. It's my third uh, conference with the Center for the Study of Conversion. And I know Ephraim and Moshe, and uh, forgive me if there's someone we're looking, I think we've been together at, at, at least two other ones. So it, it's really meaningful. Thank you to the organizers for the warm welcome, for the invitation to begin with, and this wonderful learning experience. It's been unbelievable moving between past and present, and I'm just bursting with ideas and insights and gratitude. So the topic of my paper today, and I'm hoping I can advance the slides, um, is a slice of um, a chapter of my second book, Conversion, Circumcision, Ritual Murder in Medieval Europe, which surveys Jewish conversion to Christianity in medieval Europe. Um, with an emphasis on the 13th century and with specifically an emphasis in which the historical phenomenon, this improbable phenomenon of converting to a persecuted minority religion, um, overlapped and informed and was in dialogue with Christian fears about Jews. So today what I'm going to do is present research specifically on churchmen, priests, friars, monks, deacons, and the like who converted to Judaism against all odds during the 13th and 14th centuries. Here's the game plan. So first, I'm gonna present some broad background on Christian conversion to Judaism uh, in medieval Europe, specifically the 13th century, just because it's interesting and we're kind of jumping into this, into the cold water. Um, second, I'll present evidence, the very little, as I was saying during um, Ephraim's talk, tens, <laughs> tens of maybe actual cases we have specifically of churchmen. And I can comment later maybe about, just because we have these cases doesn't mean that there were actually more churchmen converting than other kinds of Christians. I don't think so. I think there's reasons why they show up more often in the sources that survive. Mm -hmm. Third, I'll make some broader observations about what we might learn from these cases, A, about the motives and inclinations of churchmen who converted to Judaism, mm -hmm. and B, about some structural similarities or parallels between conversion to Judaism and conversion from Judaism. Some things that, that were similar in spite of the very uh, different power dynamics involved in the two kinds of moves between religions. And in conclusion, I'll consider why conversions to Judaism of some 13th century churchmen might be really important for understanding Christian attitudes and really paranoia um, about Jews in medieval Europe. So during the high and late Middle Ages, by which I mean the late 12th, 13th, and 14th centuries, and I know that we've covered a lot of ground um, chronologically today alone, in spite of increasingly difficult conditions of Jewish life, and in spite of the very real possibility, as we just heard from Ephraim, of arrest and execution by Christian authorities, although you could get off on fines, um, extant sources make very clear that a small number of Christians, by which I mean Christians born in Christian families, not Jewish converts to Christianity, who were also Christians according to church law, I've written about them too, but here I'm not talking about them, converted to Judaism formally um, in spite of, of everything that I've just mentioned. So we can't know very much about this phenomenon. Adam just asked, you know, what kinds of numbers do we have? Because um, it most often unfolded in secret. You were risking your life if you were converting, and the Jewish community that was taking you in was risking the lives of its members. So you didn't want to do it on camera. Um, it tends to surface as a phenomenon in Christian sources when it was intercepted by authorities and you got burned at the stake or fined. And um, it also surfaced in Jewish sources, especially when it created legal problems for Jewish communities that had to be adjudicated. So there were surely more conversions than we'll ever know. However, for sure, the overall, overall number was extremely small. There's no reason to think otherwise, dwarfed by the number of contemporaneous conversions in the other direction, which was massive and often um, under duress. In Italy alone, we have over a thousand conversions to Christianity from Judaism during the 13th century in one particular location. So no comparison in terms of scale. I just want to state that and make that clear at the outset. So in spite, though, of the very small number, I think it's very interesting to zero in on these cases and try to learn about them. 
Um, and in spite of a very small number, we do know that Christian authorities in the 13th and 14th centuries were extremely concerned about this phenomenon. Popes, kings, bishops, inquisitors, chroniclers, and jurists, these are all Christian authorities, all claimed that, for example, Jews wickedly drew Christians to Judaism, to Judaism and circumcised them. And we can talk later about the gender, um, the gendered nature of the language, but circumcision as a verb or as a, an act was applied to both men and women when Christians were talking about conversion to Judaism. So they can say men and women were circumcised in the Diocese of Passau in the 14th century, meaning converted to Judaism. Um, this Christian paranoia had dire consequences for Jews. These are just a handful exa of examples. Some of them I illustrated with some text. I apologize, it's both blurry and tiny. Um, 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 cases during the 13th and 14th centuries, there are many more when Christian authorities in German lands, Southern France, Northern Italy, Catalonia, Mallorca, and England threatened, prosecuted, and punished Jews on charges of converting Christians to Judaism. Um, I have a case from Toulouse, uh, Rabbi, Isaac Mal was burned at the stake on charges of having accepted the abjuration of Christianity um, of a Christian convert to Judaism named Pero. Lombardy, Meaz, everyone, Isaac, and Pesaro had their possessions confiscated for having recently led to Judaism a Christian cleric named so and so. German lands, a Jewish community threatened with repercussions on account of the actions of Rabbi Isaac, who circumcised converts. I try to mention this case, Catalonia, and Mallorca, and it goes on and on. Jews exiled, Jews' homes confiscated, possessions confiscated on charges of bringing Christians to Judaism against all odds. The intensity of Christian anxiety about conversion to Judaism in this period makes it all more interesting to ask, so what were the historical realities of this phenomenon? Extant sources, including rabbinic responsa, polem polemical texts, religious commentaries, tombstone inscriptions, a circumcision manual and the Nuremberg um, Book of Remembrance allow us to recover data about some 40, 40 individual men and women who were born into Christian families and formally converted to Judaism in the 13th century alone. So for men and women, this entailed religious instruction and ritual immersion. For men, it additionally entailed circumcision. Our sources about these cases uh, pose myriad interpretative challenges. They are geographically far flung. So we're really looking at very different local conditions. They represent different genres, as you can tell from the list of types of sources I just shared. Moreover, because these liminal figures were so polarizing, uh, Jewish and Christian authors often wrote about them in ways that either idealized or demonized them. And it can be difficult sometimes to separate layers of polemic from kernels of truth when we're trying to learn about who these men and women were. So the historian just has to be aware of that and of the limitations of what we can know. But we can learn a little something. So I'm gonna give you some examples first of um, just three women who converted to Judaism and found themselves in very different situations. So we have Rahel Hagiorat who appears as Moshe Yagor knows very well in a letter from the Cairo Geniza, married a Jew from Barcelona, who later abandoned her and their two daughters in Alexandria, Egypt. Heading to Egypt where one could uh, avoid prosecution for conversion to Christianity was something known, especially in earlier decades of the Middle Ages and centuries. In the Nuremberg Memory Book, we learned about Marut, Marat Guta Hagiorat and Marat Peslin, who made charitable bequests for the sakes of their souls to Jewish communal institutions. And I found the case of Johanna um, in uh, the diocesan archive of Barcelona in an unpublished document. Uh, she was a Christian woman from Navarre and it specifies the daughter of Christian mother and father. And then it names two Jewish women and a Jewish man who were arrested for trying to have her immersed and the church authorities succeed in bringing her back in repentance to Christianity. So there you get a sense just of you know, the geographic dispersion of my sources, but also the different fates, or sometimes we don't know the fates of these individuals. So getting to the churchmen. Strikingly, more than half of the Christian converts to Judaism who surface in Jewish and Christian sources are former churchmen, monks, friars, priests, canons, and deacons. There are well-known, and I'm just listing some of them here, 
churchmen who converted to Judaism in earlier decades of the Middle Ages. They are fascinating and there has been extensive publication on them. Um, their experiences are beyond the scope of this paper, although they present some interesting parallels with my findings about the 13th century churchmen. Also, uh, the two last individuals here are from Jewish sources, and it's noteworthy, this is a foreshadowing that we glean that these individuals were remarkably literate, all of them, and in this era, at least in Christian society, churchmen were the most lit literate members of society. And so if someone was very knowledgeable, for example, about the Bible, that's an indication that they might have um, been ordained. Okay. When we get to the 13th century, we see, and I again apologize for the scale, that former churchmen continue to appear in our sources. Some of these references should be taken with a lot of salt. For instance, when in the first um, example on the slide, we have Gerald of Wales mentioning an archdeacon, sorry, two Cistercian monks who allegedly had themselves circumcised in the Jewish rite and damnably joined themselves to the most despicable enemies of the cross of Christ. It is I like to quote, just give you the flavor of the <laughs> attitude here. Um, it's important to remember that this particular writer was notoriously imaginative and that the context of this is a satire of sort of monastic life in his time. And so you can think that he's just thinking of the most extreme crazy crime or sin that one could commit. It doesn't mean that in Wales in you know, 1201 or whatever, there were actually two Cistercian monks who went over to Judaism. On the other hand, it's the first time we hear this kind of a apostasy or, or conversion mentioned. So it's interesting that it's on his mind or it even occurs to him because never before has it appeared like this. Other cases are more credible. So for example, and famously, we have um, multiple English chronicles describing in contradictory ways, the death uh, following the Council of Oxford of 1222, which I believe somebody mentioned Hi. on Wednesday. Hi, I'm, I'm okay, there we go. Okay. Um, of a deacon who quote, had himself circumcised for love of a Jewish woman. And he was burned at the stake. Um, in the 1260s, the Bavarian Dominican inquisitor known as the Passau Anonymous noted that two priests and a deacon from his diocese were circumcised at the same time, and that a canon from Strasbourg named Ulricus Sunnelchap circumcised himself. And we don't know what became of these individuals. I'll just note that very often the language is that they circumcised themselves. We don't know if this is imitating Abraham, if this is just a manner of speaking, if this is something people are actually doing. I just note this. According to the Nuremberg Memoir Book, which is a 13th century book of remembrance from Ashkenaz, in the mid 13th century, a man who had been head of all the barefoot ones, maybe the Franciscans, a master general perhaps because they sometimes went unshod, um, and came to be known among Jews as Avraham ben Avraham Avinu of France, converted to Judaism. He met his death at the stake, where we read he was burned for the unity of God. So that's in a Jewish source, uh, and that the Nuremberg, the Nuremberg Memoir Book mentions quite a few converts to Judaism. Benedictine chroniclers and a Dominican scholar wrote about a famous London Dominican named Robert of Reading, who in 1275, quote unquote, apostatized from Christianity and flew over to the Jews, married a Jewish woman, had himself circumcised and took the name Haggai. And he was turned over to the Archbishop of Canterbury for correction. And we are told that he died unrepentant in his prison cell. Um, and I could continue giving you more and more examples, some of them here uh, from, the, from German lands. We hear, for example, I'm skipping a few, uh, Cistercian Chronicler writes about uh, someone who was a canon who relinquished the Christian faith, sullied himself by taking company with Jews, Judaized for many years, joined the Jews, was then circumcised, and we're told he was a famous scholar at the time of his joining the Jews already among Christians. And Robert of Reading, by the way, was said to have been, he's the one who died in prison, a famous Christian preacher who was very learned in the Hebrew language. Mm. And the last one I'll mention, um, in his chronicle, Henry of Hereford reports that an Augustinian canon from the town of Lengo apostatized from the Christian faith, was circumcised, and joined the Jews. He was, 
in Paris in 1297, arrested, examined, and burned. Mm -hmm. So moving on to what are we gonna do with these data points? What's the significance of this? I'd like to make two broad observations. The first, is that on the basis of this scattered evidence, we can make some conjectures about the motivations and interests of some medieval churchmen who converted to Judaism. I didn't stop and describe for each case, but in nearly all the ones that I mentioned, we know that these individuals had an interest in Hebrew or in biblical exegesis, at least. And these scholarly achievements pre and post conversion may have bridged the existence of their men in their lives, first as Christians and then as Jews. They might have been drawn to Judaism in the course of studying Hebrew and you know, Rashi's commentary on the Bible, at least, which we know Christian clergy were doing starting in England in the 12th century. Um, churchmen who wanted a deeper understanding of their own scriptures started to turn to Jewish scholars for instruction. And we know that church authorities recognized that this could be spiritually perilous. And we have records of um, meetings, yearly or annual conventions of different orders uh, demanding the discipline of certain monks who had been studying with Jewish teachers. Um, churchmen could also have become drawn to Judaism intellectually in the course of informal Jewish Christian debates. So we've heard about famous Christian disputations, Paris 1240, Barcelona 1263, Cortosa in the next century. But we glean from sources from German lands, northern and southern France, Gascony, northern Spain, what is now Italy, et cetera, that disputations happened on church corners also. And there was a lot of angst on the part of church authorities about these kinds of unsupervised exchanges that anybody could witness and sort of be struck by the arguments that were being passed back and forth. Um, I, I'm not gonna give you, but I, I could share you know, evidence about the Christian authorities' consternation about these kinds of Jewish Christian encounters. Moreover, a remark in the commentary on Psalms of the 13th century Jewish scholar, David Kimchi, who was born in Arbonne, suggests that Christian fears about the potential impact of such disputations were not unfounded because David Kimchi says that he had seen with his own eyes, French Christians convert to Judaism. I'm sure he's exaggerating, but still it's an interesting image upon discovering Jewish ways of refuting Christological interpretations of Psalm three, for example. So you can picture the background to that kind of an observation. Okay, significantly, like a number of earlier medieval converts from Christianity to Judaism, post-conversion, some of these individuals go on and engage in anti-Christian polemics. Asso Anonymous, this 13th century inquisitor from um, German lands, wrote that churchmen who converted to Judaism tossed the pearls of the church before swine referring to Matthew chapter seven, verse six, and that they produced writings full of blasphemies against Christ and against the sacraments of the church. So I think this points right away to an interesting parallel in the ways, um, the behaviors of converts in both directions, because there are very famous Jewish converts to Christianity who become notorious as anti-Jewish polemicists during the Middle Ages, and who are featured as the Christian disputants, for example, at Paris in 1240, at Barcelona in 1263, and uh, later on in Spain, who are really the driving force behind the, the worsening conditions of life for Jews. So, so I'm thinking um, we don't have to name them. So I think we can already begin to glean what might be some of the reasons why converts in both directions might be well suited to uh, martial arguments against their former faiths, right? They've been educated in the faith that they've now rejected. They want to incur favor among their new religion, co-religionists, demonstrate their allegiance to their new community. They might have an ax to grind, personal or intellectual or otherwise against their former community. And it's interesting that we see this behavior among converts in both directions, I think. Um, and the engagement of some Christian converts to Judaism in anti-Christian polemics also points to a link that could have existed between individual converts in the two directions. At least one Christian convert to Judaism is recorded as having refuted specifically the arguments against Judaism 
of a Jewish convert to Christianity. So in the Sefer Nitzchon Yashan, which is a 13th century uh, polemical compilation, uh, Yitzhak Hager pointed to inconsistencies in Christian interpretations of Isaiah in countering the claims of a Jewish convert to Christianity. And in this instance, we have two converts, one from Christianity to Judaism, the other one from Judaism to Christianity, who are dueling indirectly as warriors for their new faiths. So that was my first broad observation that um, it had to do with the intellectual motivations and engagements of churchmen converts. And now I'll turn to my second broad observation. And this regards a structural parallel in Jewish and Christian attitudes toward converts, which I think is also intuitive. Both Christians and Jews, for all of their circumstantial differences and the ways Jews were to a large extent at the mercy of Christians in this period, um, viewed the conversions of learned religious leaders from the other group as like the ultimate vindication and prize and testament to the truth and superiority of their own faith and community. So for Jews, this is apparent in folklore, uh, in polemics, for example, in the attribution of the influential Jewish anti-Christian polemics that they uh, Nestor Hakomer, the book of Nestor the priest about a likely fictional character, a uh, former Christian priest, and the Hebrew version of this work explains that this individual detested the faith of the uncircumcised Christians and their error and took shelter under the wings of the divine presence. I know we recognize all this language from uh, papers over the uh, yesterday and today, and he entered the Jewish faith and he circumcised the flesh of his foreskin. We see a lot of the same phrases. Um, and that as a convert to Judaism, he possessed special skills because he understood and knew all the darkness and error of Christianity in which he had previously been enshrouded. And he now had a unique ability to understand and explain to Jews the erroneous faith of the uncircumcised and offer true testimony about God. And we have many later medieval Jewish authors who are quoting from this uh, text and thus reflecting and perpetuating the sense that churchmen who converted to Judaism were uniquely knowledgeable and that their conversions constituted valuable corroboration of the superiority of Judaism to Christianity. Um, and I'll just mention one other uh, piece of evidence about this. Jewish pride in the conversions of churchmen appears also in a legend of which variants abounded in medieval um, Ashkenazi traditions, specifically of the German pietists attesting to the particular appeal to some Jews, at least of the fantasy that high ranking Christian clergy would convert to Judaism. This tale featured the conversion to Judaism of the Archbishop of Salzburg, who was said to have left his Christian faith, converted to Judaism and become faithful to the creed of Israel. And we have characters like this in medieval polemica. I think it's interesting to con connect it to the imagination, but then also to the more modest reality of conversions of churchmen. And of course, among Christians too, there's unmistakable predilection for learned and high-ranking converts. So when the hagiographer of Thomas Aquinas, uh, the great scholastic, is extolling his many accomplishments, and talks about the conversions of Jews that he accomplished, he always says he was a very wealthy Jew and a very learned Jew and a very influential Jew because that adds it's such a more valuable you know, conversion. I think that relates in interesting ways to some of the conversation this morning about the status of different types of converts and efforts to convert different groups. Um, okay, so with all of this in mind, we may now be better equipped to understand the intensity of Christian anxiety about conversion to Judaism in 13th century Europe. This anxiety had multiple contributing streams, uh, most of which I've not even mentioned today. So I'm not saying it's because 10 deacons converted to Judaism. Um, these include, at this time, in general, heightened anxiety about religious deviance. This is the time when we have the papal inquisition established to persecute, uh, prosecute Alpha Gentians and Christian heretics of various stripes. We've got a lot of concern about conversion to Islam as well. This has to do with the uh, evolution of anti-Judaism, as Ephraim mentioned, with the Jews viewed increasingly as threatening Christians, not only physically, like this time we have ritual murder charges, well poisoning charges a little bit later, as Zafir Barzilai has recently wonderfully, his book has just come out about well poisoning um, and a uh, host desecration, et cetera, not only physically, but also spiritually threatening the well-being of their host society. And um, also, 
to the point of returning apostates, there is a lot of recognition that insofar as we have all of these Jews converting to Christianity, many of them aren't sticking with Christianity and they are backsliding to use a Christian term. And this is tantamount in terms of canon law to Christian apostasy because they're baptized. So now if they go back to Judaism, they're apostatizing from Christianity. But I think that this handful of actual conversions including of churchmen to Christianity um, is part of the picture as well, because it was known that actual conversions did occur. And those of former churchmen must have rankled Christian authorities, especially deeply. Any number was too great of conversions to Judaism. Uh, it was a total repudiation of the Christian faith and specifically an embracing of the faith against which Christianity understood itself as um, having sort of superseded and defined itself as the truth against the falsehood and the lightness against the darkness and the spirit against the flesh. And um, so it was not even the same necessarily as conversion, for example, to Islam, but that's a different conversation, joining the arch enemies in Christian salvation history. But it's also alarming because it exposes the fragility and instability of Christian identity in spite of its economic, political, and social dominance in this period, and suggests that a millennium after the purported defeat of Judaism, Judaism remains potent and vibrant and appealing in some sense, and that even the most learned members of Christian society are susceptible to its appeal. Um, Indeed, churchmen had the best knowledge of Christian scriptures and theology, and they were in some cases risking death for this change. Moreover, insofar as some clergy were public figures, word of their apostasy to Judaism could spread rapidly and bear the potential to be destabilizing within their communities. And I could bring evidence of articulations of such fears, but I only have one sentence left. Um, such extreme, wicked, subversive behavior, Christian authorities reasoned, could only result from diabolical Jewish machinations. In no uncertain terms, I could bring many voices saying this, resonating and, and just saying it in different ways. I'll quote just one. These conversions of churchmen seemed to suggest that no segment of Christian society was safe from the Jews. As King Charles of Naples put it in 1289, the Jews were intent on subverting all whom they could. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have some time here. Ooh. Questions? Thank you so much. Very, very stimulating, fascinating. Uh, two uh, associations. Uh, uh, one, um, Thanks very much for pointing out the intellectual attraction. Um, in the 15th century, as far as I am aware, uh, Christian interest in Hebrew uh, re-emerged uh, in, let's say, humanist terms. But what seems to have attracted Christians most about uh, Hebrew sources was the belief uh, that uh, some sort of uh, hidden um, revelation is to be found in Jewish Hebrew sources. Uh, the um, uh, Kabbalistic tradition and so on was especially attractive in the 15th century. So my question is, um, in this regard, is there any prehistory to that in the previous uh, centuries? Can you see any traces for that? And the other association uh, concerns, let's say, the individual aspect <clears throat> and so, so, social aspect of uh, conversions in the sense that uh, on the one hand um, we are focusing we are of course focusing on the social situation and uh, context uh, status of converts but um, at the same time many of these stories are quite existentially um, threatening and 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 and, and uh, challenging stories life stories for the individuals um, and of course, conflict, you mentioned that, I think, but uh, my question is whether we know more about it. Conflict within the original community may also be a reason for people to move to another community. Now, uh, the association is this uh, very 
intriguing case. Uh, I don't know how many of you are aware of the story of uh, Israel Zoli. This is a case that is very close to me in Rome. He was a chief rabbi of Rome during the Second World War mm -hmm. and was baptized in 1945. Um, and uh, he had been interested in Jesus for a long time. He had written a book about Jesus before the war. And, uh, but then he had a very difficult conflict uh, also within the Jewish community in Rome and was baptized just afterwards. Mm -hmm. So in his case, my sense is that two things came together. Uh, one was the, the very personal, very honest religious interest in the other religion or in Jesus and so on as Christ. Uh, at the same time, he was very much challenged by his situation during the war and so on in his community. So I'm wondering whether somehow, of course, several aspects may come together in individual yes. cases. And we can't even see into people's hearts nowadays, let alone sure. let alone centuries back, let alone on the basis of a sentence. So, so as a historian, I'm very limited in when I speculate, which is all I can do about motivations. Even if I had a diary, which I've never had a diary to analyze, because from the Middle Ages we don't have diaries. Um, so. Christian Hebraism in the 15th century, and as, as uh, I heard you saying, so there's a lot of interest in Kabbalah. So in my period, so the, the Zohar, for example, which is sort of the central work of Kabbalah, this is put into writing in the 13th century, so that's kind of not yet disseminated. And what I know about Christian study of Hebrew and Jewish exegesis in the 12th, 13th centuries is not uh, about mysticism. It is really about interpreting the Bible and learning the Hebrew language, but it's not my area of expertise, and I would love to learn from anyone who knows otherwise. But it's at the same time part of the same story of Christian scholarly fascination with an interest differently motivated uh, in Judaism and Hebrew in their own right, but also as a way to a deeper truth, even hopefully for them at least at the get-go Christian truth, but sometimes you think of unintended consequences. So um, in terms of conflict pre-conversion, it's very clear in the cases of some Jewish converts to Christianity in the Middle Ages that there was communal conflict. We, they were considered heretical or they disagreed with how a, local authorities were handling things and then they go over to Christianity and it's probably not coincidence and, and even Donin, Donin, yes Donin, nicholas Donin, Donin, for example <laughs> and even among a non-famous converts i have cases from archives in barcelona of converts who to from judaism to christianity who we hear also they like got into a fist fight in, in synagogue you know like they they weren't happy i don't know it's just a clue one can connect the dots one has to be careful because there's so many dots most of them were lost but yes i don't have usually with these individuals i have one <laughs> data point I don't know the before or the after. I just know that at this point in time, they were in this situation. And so all I can do is look in aggregate and see what are what's the range of situations people find themselves in, but I can never tell a story about an individual, which is very frustrating. <laughs> um, did that address yes, your question? Yes. Okay. I've already talked about this. Oh, um, thank you so much. This was fascinating. Uh, um, so I, I, I'm coming from a totally different field and I know nothing about this. So let me ask some, uh, just a couple of questions from my friends. Um, in your period, are Jews supposed to be ambivalent about the idea of people converting to Judaism um, mm -hmm. and or resistant to that and best ambivalent? And if that's the case, um, how are they? How do they navigate being secretly thrilled about having <laughs> a former churchman convert to Judaism while also expressing ambivalence or resistance? Thank you so much for that question. It allows me to correct the misimpression I must have given. Secretly, well, the secret would have to be very emphasized, but I don't think there was like the Pope didn't convert to so it's, yeah. a fantasy is one thing. Maybe you, with your interest in Freud, maybe you can help us reconcile how these things can coexist. But there's no Jewish mission to convert non-Jews to Christianity in this context, and in fact, there's a lot of um, resistance and disapproval of involvement. Right, there are efforts to. Uh, discourage conversion 
in keeping with Talmudic instructions to send the person away three times. And we see this repeated in 13th century materials as well, because it's considered a danger to life. And it is a danger to life in many cases. And uh, it's, it's a little bit of a mystery how in some places, nevertheless, there were Jews who were willing to take the risk. And there were Christians who managed to go through the process. But I would say that it was definitely not a unified enthusiasm for this. And it was really risky for everyone involved. I would invite Professor Kennerfogel maybe to chime in here. Hmm. Yeah, I, very hard to answer the question. Very hard to answer the question. Um, you can mention Rami's paper. What's that? Rami has this. Well, so, so, so there is, I mean, there is, there is here, by the way, it relates to what I talked about a little bit, I didn't mean it to, but 12th century French Tosafists are extremely welcoming of converts, right? And that's, but that's after the fact, right? In other words, they're not, they're not recruiting, right? 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 They're extremely welcoming after it. They have them in their house. They have them benching. They have questions. Can they leave the grazing after meals because you have to sort of be part of all kinds of interesting questions. Now. But the fact is, there's a famous passage in Ravia, who I mentioned, where... Um, uh, um, uh, in tractate Megillah, where somebody was a Christian, somebody who converted, and he asked, he asked the rabbis of Wurzburg and some of the Rabbi rabbis, he had a, a Vulgate or something, he had a, a Latin Bible, and his Latin was a little better than his Hebrew. And so he wanted to know, could he, Bring learn, the could, could he learn from it? Could he study from it? And of course, the rabbis of Wurzburg argued with the rabbis of the Rhine land, you know, that, that and and um, and they they also had a question about him leading the services, and they also argued the other way. You know, a lot of arguments there. Um, but this is all after the fact. So so because again, you can't be too. There is no mission. That's absolutely correct. There's no doubt about it. So that's the problem here. On a theoretical level, I think Powell's not wrong. On a theoretical level, in an ideal world, you know, it, it's, it's, also, what? it's a compliment. No, no, no. <laughs> the, 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 you know, this is a little bit like like Professor Grossman's stuff on Galut Hamidayarek. You know, will all Christians have to? What's that? You will not sleep. There is a theory which in which there are Jews who will say, you know, let's get everybody. But that's very theoretical. That's that's again, that's a messianic kind of a thing. But I don't think I don't think beyond that it's very, very hard to I, I also very hard pressed to you know, stop. But in terms of the question itself, I mean, yeah. isn't I mean, first of all, how self-reflective are these people? Right. But, but more than that, just because you don't want to lose doesn't mean you don't want to win. In other words, <laughs> yeah. a, 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 someone could say, I'm not going to be a missionary, I'm not going to be active. But if people are, you know, knocking on the doors, they're like, you see, you see, we didn't do anything. I mean, something else that's interesting is that we have women helping women convert. We have... And so in the case of Johanna, where I actually have a document of practice, this woman who's brought back to Christianity by the bishop, and it says that these two women, who were Seta and Vilida are their names in Barcelona, were instructing her. And presumably they were gonna help her with her immersion. And we have in the circumcision manual, you know, the women go in while she circumcises, the men wait outside. Um, and women, we sort of, we have, we have all different members of the Jewish community who are participating in different ways. We have Jews who are housing converts, some of them even before they're circumcised. Mm -hmm. So they're part of the process along the way. It's, it's not just a rabbinic court or. Right, and there are examples in say Hasidim of, of conversion processes that got interrupted. They were starting to go on and they couldn't because uh, there's also, there are passages in Tosfot, weird passages about, you know, Convert us into roughness. It's very uh, something went on there. Or, or they were scared to do the, con the circumcision. That's right. Right. Well, that's, yeah. Right. They were too they, afraid to do the right. That, that's the same for Hasidim pass, but the other passages. Yeah. So the problem here is there's there's always going to be more actually happening than we have sources for. The danger is to assume there's a complete tasia here. You know, uh, there's a complete industry uh, going on here because that would be a grave mistake. But uh, oh, but this is all very helpful. Um, and any, you mentioned the uh, romantic uh, motivation. Mm -hmm. So do you have more examples of that or mostly the examples of from learning and, you know, some... It's churchmen. <laughs> so so um, I, don't, I don't know 
what motivations were. I know that many converts, there is a note that they married someone after they converted. That doesn't mean that they converted in order to marry that person. Mm -hmm. We don't know when they met the person or how that was arranged, but it is often noted both for women and for men. Mm -hmm. One would speculate that that's a natural guess, right? That there's a human relationship because in, in medieval Europe, Jews and Christians interact with a lot in many places. That's one of the big prizes here. I was gonna, I was gonna everybody's been asking it really very well. You know, Yaakov Katz um, quietly, but clearly uh, assumed that conversion was more, mostly ideological. He's got a little bit of exclusive tolerance. He seems to assume that. And um, and because of these early church, you know, the early period, and somebody like uh, David Malkiel uh, argued venal, and 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 you wisely talk about both, and I learned from you, so I do it also. The question is whether we have any more evidence. You know, I, as I kept hearing you say churchmen, 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 I'm going, oh, the the ideological is winning, but then you said, you know. Romance, 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 you know. It's but then a, it's hard to know whether quote, yeah. are the Christian sources just trying to demean right, the conversion right, by right. saying, oh, it was lust. Right, these are not open opposites. That's really, that's because really. that's actually a broader trope uh, with uh, a mass, different orders criticizing each other in the period. Could have, so that would be very important for this, a very important prize for this kind of a study. Can we get any any real sense? But you're right. The problem is the sources are not, auto, they're not autobiographical. They're, there's a writer of the sources and they may be spinning it. Moshe, Moshe, thank you so, thank you very much, um, as always. And I, there's one case I, I can't remember now. Maybe you you have it in your book in the Cairo Geniza. There's a, a it, we don't know the date, um, but it's a, like a first person story of a churchman converting to Judaism, and he says when the, when the multi basaro lati, so I circumcised myself, and I I I. I, I you know, had polemics with the, with the big bishop, and I wrote pamphlets, and I said to them, the Christians, if you can answer me the questions in these pamphlets, I will I will return. But and then they put me in jail, and then the um, the, um, the guardian uh, had a dream, and he rescued me through the window, and then of course it cuts in the middle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But then I have uh, then this, this thing about. What, what you said, like the second broad observation of, of winning the people from the other side, and especially the educated men. So in Islamic lands, where we can put aside the, um, the fear from the authorities and the secrecy, and Jews and can convert to Christianity or vice versa, we almost, the yeah. Muslims do not care most of the time. So we have several such cases on both directions. Mm -hmm. And one of them, I, I just want to read it to you because it's exactly the same as you as you quoted. This is from a Coptic, um, it's in Arabic, but it's Coptic, uh, the history of the Patriarch of Alexandria. And it's um, written in the 13th century and it's about the story in the 12th century. And the, the specific Jew so-and-so, who was of the eminent ones of his people and a learned scholar of the notables from the notables of his community and he became Christian, his name was so-and-so, and he spoke the Coptic language in a very short time and he used to debate with the Jews in the Hebrew language and to interpret to the Christians in the Coptic language. And he became expert in Christian religion and became one of the, their, the Christian most learned men. Um, and he had um, suffered heavily from the Jews and, but he um, uh, he remained a Christian and he used to walk among the Jews in Fustat for 40 years. And he's mentioned in two different Christian um, compositions from, from that period. Um, and in manuscript, we have um, questions and he and polemic answers um, in favor of Christianity. Uh, supposedly uh, written by like questions he is asked by a Jew, <coughs> his name is given, and his answers are yeah. the same person's name and his answer as a Christian, as a learned Christian. Mm -hmm. yeah. And another case of parallels that reminds me of some of the earlier papers, and we were, what do you do with parallels? Yeah, yeah go ahead. <laughs> okay, cool. So uh, I very much enjoyed the paper. Thank you very much. Very illuminating. I want to relate to the point of scriptural interpretation. I think often studies uh, of conversion, particularly in the Middle Ages, 
um, it's very important to make this point. Uh, they don't draw enough from scriptural interpretation or connect themselves enough to questions of scriptural interpretation and how important they may or may not have been to these people. Somehow it's always a question of parallels, um, mm. motivations, but you, I think you're absolutely right that without understanding better what's going on in the scriptural interpretive sphere, it, 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 it's hard to get it at the ideology. So, of course, I'm sure you are aware that the rise of the literal school, the Pshat school in Jewish exegesis, so much has been so much has been written about the effect of Christian exegesis and polemic with Christian exegesis on Rashi and Rashbam and the French school and vice versa, Rashi's works entering monasteries in some way or another. Uh, just recently, Barry Wolfish and Sarah Yefet published a Rashi text um, that seems to have crossed the lines in terms of biblical interpretation and Song of Songs interpretation and Rashbam. Uh, Rashbam, but also Rashi. They also showed Rashi. So it's, it's a very difficult question to understand how much Christian and Jews on both sides in the high Middle Ages uh, saw this question of the right, so to speak, interpretation of the Bible and the right method of interpreting it as a life or death question for them mm. as intellectuals. It seems to be a lot is going on. And um, maybe this should be connected more to questions about conversion. Because if I don't interpret the text correctly, then what am I doing as a, uh, as a believer in my faith, whatever that faith is? In the Islamic world, it's less important because as you rightly pointed out, Islam and Judaism are not competing about the same books. The Muslims have the Quran and whatever the Jews wrote or didn't write or however they interpret their scripture doesn't make any difference for their understanding of the Quran. It doesn't threaten them in any way. But for Jews and Christians, this is a, a, a vital question. And so I think you're absolutely right in suggesting that this should be further worked out, though how to do it seems to me very difficult. Um, how to connect it, it seems a challenge to me to the issue of conversion. Uh, so you made me think oh, more Thank you that. so much for those comments. I, I, I actually, you're, you're very generous in how you phrased them. I haven't looked enough at issues of biblical exegesis and their relation to conversion. Mm -hmm. I just noticed that some of these individuals were engaged in that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I could actually go back and see what were they writing about or commenting on. And that would be interesting yes. as a starting point. Yes. And then there's the elite versus, many of our sources are written by intellectual elites. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, I, I often am a little nervous about generalizing from those sources mm -hmm. about broader trends. Mm -hmm. But in this case, we have sources, chronicles, trial records, the things I listed, they are written by learned men, intellectual yes. elites. But we actually have an opportunity maybe to learn more about some of those individuals. Mm -hmm. And so it's a tighter, yes focus and we actually have an opportunity to go deeper to learn about those individuals without maybe generalizing too yes. far afield yes. by learning more about their ideology their intellectual world and the way they're interpreting texts so i, I hadn't thought of it that way and, thank you and so the much. way they're teaching their students too and trying to keep them in or let them give them a bit more leverage to go out, you know, look at what the Christians are doing with the Bible, look at what the Jews. Certainly there is a kind of little renaissance there in terms of the intellectual connections. So despite the cruelty, the obvious cruelty of, of sanctioning movement from one community to the other, there is a parallel <laughs> movement of great interest in one another, particularly around the scriptures. So um, 
it's very interesting to see it in that light too, or at least look at, for instance, if they're interpreting Ruth, these guys, they're interpreting certain books in the Bible. I would try to see what's yeah. going on there. That yeah. I have tried to look at. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. Leslie Smith has a translation. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, Thank you. We'll stop here. Thank you.